learning. And, uh, so I think it will feel less like a restart and more really kind of building on momentum and issues. And it, it needs to be quite interactive quite early on. So we'll, we'll you know, be hearing from each of these panelists, but I think with a sense of kind of provocation and opening the room up. I just, uh, in the sort of course of even this morning and hearing the extraordinary presentations and, and, and starting to feel the questions, I took just a few what are sort of stray uh, thoughts um, in t that might just frame some of what might emerge uh, in the next uh, in this next session. Um, so we're talking here, of course, somewhat specifically about training the next generation, uh, what we're building, what we're shaping. Um, but implicit in that, of course, for us, where whether we're positioned in academic institutions or wherever we are, we work in a field of, of, that's about imparting, right? It's about collaborative spaces and facilitating. So um, the, the most fundamental questions about our practice belong here, not just questions of a syllabus for a certain course, but the questions of how we impart. Um, it seems to me that the question of what we even mean by cultural diplomacy is very live in this space, and so many people in this room, Daniel, Jonathan, Paul, Cynthia, Roberta, have spoken to this powerfully. There's a sort of reading list we could build and we should post on the website to inform this. But this is a really, uh, it seems to me, a huge question, and I think many of us feel that there's a, a kind of paradigm shift away from a notion of display, right? We bring this to you. We are from here, and we bring this to here. Um, and towards deeper kinds of models of facilitation, collaboration, um, activating others. The skills that we may talk about here aren't just skills of, of, um, of, of artistry, though they are or of artistry in the traditional sense, but of imparting agency to others. How do we do that? Um, uh, and that feels like sometimes hard to talk about it, the kind of tolerance for the unknown and the unknowable that, we're, that, we're, that comes with that, because it's not necessarily a, um, a reportable, commodifiable outcome. Um, so um, I think just a few things that happened this morning. Uh, this idea that Sugini Madison talked about so beautifully in terms of, as she was talking about performance tactics, performance has a methodology. This is a foundation of what we mean at Georgetown and others who are teaching performance studies is we learn a craft, but performance is a way of doing other things in spaces. Um, uh, the quote of Toni Morrison's about the beauty and the politics being mutually enforcing, mutually enhancing, what does it mean to learn to do both in harmony? How do we teach that? How do you have both going on? And what about for the many of us, probably the majority, who kind of know one better than the other. It's like having a really strong right arm, and then but believe in the other. So I'm an artist. I went, you know, and I'm, I'm not talking about me in the first person, but you know, theater training gave me this piece of it. But the oh, this other part of me is migrating to this. But how do we get to have those both really operational um, together? Um, and then the last thing I'll raise before introducing uh, the, Emma, who will uh, begin the panel. And again, I think it's very live here. Where is the question of privilege in this conversation? Who gets trained where? Who's, at this, in this, who's in this room? Who isn't in this room but is being spoken for? Um, this has come up already, uh, but I think needs to surface here because this is about certain contexts for training certain people to go do certain things with other certain people. Um, uh, is it possible to imagine a truly diverse context, culturally, aesthetically, economically, for training and learning within some of the elite institutions that have resources. How do we create that space? Can we do, how does that look like? Um, it's certainly a dream of, you know, that I think for Georgetown to do what, what the promise would be, or a place like it, that that needs to be carefully considered, um, that it's not one dimensional in that way. Um, and I was just really struck by uh, Carol um, and Ping talking about that project, so forcefully talking about what happens when students are inspired about this work and the responsibility of then caring for that student as they move through the world and want to go out and do it. What are we cultivating? Roberta's comment about do no harm, which is so huge for us. Like, what are we 
sending them out to, especially in spaces like this one and where many of the, the institutions are, where the students have so many choices, actually, like to do this work is such a choice. Um, so uh, we're really fortunate at Georgetown, and I know we aren't alone, but to have so many students specifically invested in this and passionate about this intersection between theater practice and international politics. Some of them sit in the School of Foreign Service, but they basically end up doing a theater major. They just don't get credit for it in the way it works now. Although the fact that Dean Lancaster shows up at our at this, maybe that's maybe there are new frontiers uh, being built there. And some of them are theater and performance studies majors, but who are incredibly active in courses around. Uh, and Maya, our, our director of our program, will speak to this, but in all kinds of interdisciplinary courses around performance and activism, performance and social change, political theater, performance and society, learning tactics, practices, and I'll just give a shout out to the extraordinary acting together on the World Stage project with Cynthia Cohen and her colleagues, Roberta, the folks from Theater Without Borders. That project has, has given us an anchor, I feel like, in that work curricularly that I've been searching for for years, and so many other pieces, but so many of you are involved in that. So, I want to begin this panel, and then we'll introduce the others, by introducing you to one extraordinary undergraduate student here at Georgetown. It's Summer. She's one among many, so she's speaking for a lot of people, but she's very much speaking for herself, who is emblematic of this, of this intersection. And she's just going to talk for a few minutes about her specific work um, and sort of what's happening here at Georgetown, because I think it's a way into us all grappling together with what are we making? And we, you know, what, what are we doing together um, going forward? So this is Emma Clark. Um, I wrote down what I wanted to say, so otherwise I probably would have forgotten every single bit of it. Um, but first, before I start, I just want to echo what Derek said about, about Carol and paying your work. Um, I think if you gave any student on this particular campus a ticket to the Congo and you know, said go to your theater, we would be on the plane before our parents could say no. Um, I think the fact that you were so focused on finding those kind of opportunities and finding that trajectory for students is, is really heartening for some of the Canadian my friends here. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I just want to start off by saying it's been such an honor to be here and to listen to all of you on the panels. It's kind of rare that you get to see the embodied people that you've been studying and aspiring to and, and their work and you know, to see you all in this room. It's a really rare opportunity for Earth's undergraduate student. Um, as Derek mentioned, my name is Emma Clark, and I'm actually I'm going to be an undergraduate senior in the School of Foreign Service here, which is what houses all of our international relations or international affairs degrees. So it's a little different than most schools in that we don't just have one international relations degree. It's a whole school devoted to global affairs. Um, and we come out with a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service. Um, but generally, I spend all of my free time in this building um, <laughs> because I I do theater, uh, student theater is, is a wonderful community here, and so I ended up being, as Derek said, basically a theater major without the credit, and I'm also an international politics student. Um, so just a little background on sort of why, why I'm here right now, what led me here. Um, as most of you probably do, I personally have a intense sense of wanderlust. I, I have always, since I was very small, been, been obsessed with, with the globe. Um, and throughout some, some really wonderful international sort of exchanges that I had in music and in sports when, when I was in high school, I suddenly found myself sort of face to face with a possible degree in international relations. You know, I was, I was applying for college and wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do, but I, but I realized that, you know, I, I want to know more about the world and that seemed like a great way to do it. So, so I applied to schools and had to study international relations. Um, and ended up here, which was which was wonderful because this really is one of the best locations and, and the best schools for that particular work. Um, I entered Georgetown intending to do theater extracurricularly because I wasn't really sure, you know, what there was academically, what, whether it was just a theater major. And you know, some schools you can only do it if you're a theater major. Um, so I so I tried out for one of the clubs, and I ended up getting into a musical. And since then, I got way more than I ever, ever anticipated and have sort of been sucked in in an irrevocable way. Um, because what I came into contact was was a, a crash course in sort of a theater community and culture that's happening on this particular campus that I've never heard of among my friends who went to other schools and that I had never seen before, never imagined before. Um, so I sort of, from then on out, resigned myself to the fact that I needed to have my hands in, in 
here in this department, and as well as I wanted to continue studying international po politics, I didn't want to, you know, transfer schools because I very much still wanted to learn about politics and global affairs, um, but I wasn't going to accept doing one or the other. I, I needed to have my hands in both in a, in a large way. Um, so instead of the sort of vaguely defined notions that I had before about what I was going to major in, uh, the School of Foreign Service has this wonderfully special major that's dear to my heart called the Cultural and Politics major, and yes, Professor Krupa is here um, representing you at that as a, as a professor, but it's, it's really a unique and wonderful program in that it's the only major in that school that is sort of self-designed um, and has a large degree of freedom. Um, the other majors have a much more defined and strict core of classes that you should have to take, which is, which is great because they're more specified areas, but in Culture and Politics you sort of you take the area of culture that interests you and the area of politics that interests you, if that sounds vague. But, um, so you can come at it from a, a wide uh, variety of interests and, and sort of areas and backgrounds. Uh, so what I ended up doing, it's uh, at first it felt sort of like an upstream swim because I didn't really know. I was like, well, I'm, I'm in the International Affairs School, but I'm going to do theater. That sounds silly and um, sounds like something you're not able to do. but it turned out that it very much was, and that I was sort of part of a tide of students who had already been doing that, who will continue to do that, who are presently doing it. Um, right now, my, my sort of self-designed theme is, I think it's worded as theater as a means for post-conflict reconstruction and reconciliation. So in that vein, I've taken a lot of classes. I've been able to pick and choose from different departments all across the campus in history, international affairs, justice and peace studies. Um, so I've, I can study anything from international development to to war, conflict studies, as well as take classes in theater, and this department has a wonderful tradition of offering classes that really engage both those areas from a performance point of view. So with Maya, I've taken world theater history, with Derek, I just finished a class in performance in society, I've taken performance in activism, and I've combined those with social justice classes, conflict studies classes, international development classes, and so that's kind of where I've carved this major out of, and it's really trying to engage both all of those worlds. Um, thanks to, in part to Derek's recommendation, um, I will also be departing for a fellowship in Cambodia in next week, actually, um, to study nation building, post-genocide, and sort of how traditional Cambodian arts have, have fit into that. And I got the chance to, to speak a bit with Katrin Few, who was um, who referenced yesterday. She's providing me some advice and guidance. So I'm really trying to, to do this out in the world in a sort of self-led way at the moment. Um, to tell you a little bit more about, about the undergraduates here at Georgetown, um, it's, it's kind of been funny the past couple of days hearing students is like, they. Um, so being one of them, it's, it's great to have this opportunity to speak to all of you as a student. Um, and from the perspective of an undergraduate student here at Georgetown, this is the soul of this work that, that we do here, as much as, much as it's located in the professors and, and they're amazing. Um, to me, it's very much located in sort of the passion and the hearts and the minds of the students here. Because it's, it's an incredible student populace, and I'm very biased to any of you who are from other institutions, but I think this is one of the first communities I've experienced academically in which nearly, like ubiquitously, nearly all of the students are just so passionate, so engaged, and so active. I mean, no one here is passive in whatever it is they care about, and that doesn't have to be politics per se. I mean, if you're studying history or health, science, whatever it is, everyone I've encountered on this campus is just so active and dedicated and you know willing to challenge and debate and confront these issues in a really, really active way. And I think part of that is because of the nature of the atmosphere that's created here at Georgetown and the chance to be in Washington, D.C., which is a wonderful resource for us, obviously. Um, so, given that, this, this atmosphere here and the chance to be in Washington, D.C., it's created sort of a, an experimental playground, I like to think of it as, for, for some conscious and engaged art here on this campus. Um, this past fall, one of my close friends here, he's an international student from Indonesia, he directed an original device piece called Hashtag Courage, which responded to sort of the impact of social media and the changing context of revolution in the Arab Spring. And that was all done through our student-written one Act festival um, on one of our several entirely student-run theater companies here on campus. Um, this spring, one of my classes put on a showcase performance of our semester's work in ethnographic research, um, an interview performance based upon our exploration and sort of 
living experience of what Occupy DC was doing here in the city. Um, I mean, my friends, we can throw around names. Thanks, thanks to these wonderful professors and sort of our own interests, we, we can throw around names like Bilal and Brecht in the same breath as like Shakespeare or Sondheim. It's, it's that breadth of interest that they've really helped cultivate in us. Um, as students here, we crave a creative outlet for our sort of curiosity for and our questions about engagement with the world just as much as we crave knowledge of how to become better theater artists, which is a little bit of what Derek prefaced with in that how you combine the, the teaching of students who you know, want to become better actors, directors, stage managers, whatever it is, with students who want to, still, to, to really study politics, diplomacy, other issues and bring those two together because um, they can often be often seen as mutually exclusive. Uh, I think that's sort of what a lot of my friends and I have been trying to do. Is we want our hands in both worlds, so how do you help that and foster that? Um, devise an ensemble-based work here coexists with more traditional play production and sort of a unique laboratory of exposure that I had never, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know what Devise was when I graduated high school, no idea. Um, as students, we're blessed to have a program and an inspired group of student-run theater clubs that allow for students by diversity of backgrounds and interests to have access to ownership over and involvement in theater making. On this campus, anyone who wants to be a part of theater can in some way or another, um, no matter where you're coming from. In the span of three years, I've been an actor, producer, designer, and more. In a few short months, I'll be a director for the very first time. And I've done this alongside students from all four undergraduate colleges with as many combinations of majors and minors as you can possibly imagine. So the work for finding our voices and reflecting back and saying something about our society, our politics, and our ways of seeing the world is really intertwined with our growth as students who understand the elements of creating theater in a way that is really personal, really singular here, and at times very confusing. <laughs> All this being said, I'm naturally left with many questions. For example, how can we make it possible for theory to meet practice when university schedules and logistics make it very difficult to be, for students to be sort of up close with the community in a really meaningful and sort of time-intensive way. Um, how can students learn to be quality theater artists in the traditional sense and be equally involved in a wider area of academic studies, such as international affairs? Um, how can we increase transparency, access, and networks for students coming out of college, like I'm about to do, um, who want to do this type of work but may not necessarily know where to begin? Um, and all of these questions are active in the minds of our panelists, and with that, I will turn it over to them. Coming to this, so things got kind of wonderful. Uh, coming to this gathering, uh, cold as it were, uh, but not you know. Obviously, we've been in a lot of correspondence, but um, she's assistant professor of culture and politics in the School of Foreign Service. So just given that was preface, it seemed interesting. I'm also struck your interest. I know combine geography, architecture, and performance studies. And so for me, as we were corresponding, and it's interesting to see. Uh, Professor Randy Bass and John Bregstra here, who are uh, extraordinarily inventive thinkers about our curriculum here at Georgetown, and have been influential to me in terms of thinking about how even, to me, this question actually is a question of geography and architecture and performance, like how these things come together in a, you know, in a very direct way. So, um, we might, I think we might speak to that. Okay, okay. Um, well, I'll just start with a little bit, very brief background, just to position me here a little bit, um, since I'm coming Late, late in the conversation, right? So, um, but I'm really excited to be here. It's very exciting, um, and um, I really enjoy listening to your comments. Can you guys speak a little more about Okay, okay. Um, so, um, in terms of, I have sort of two overarching interests um, that I work on, um, and um, my realms of practice kind of circle around. And the first would be, um, I'm a geographer by training, but the first would be this a notion of exhibitionary modernity. And what I just mean by that is to think about um, an approach to culture that looks at um, the exhibitionary field of cultural production. So this might be, for me, has been a way to think about the relationship of, um, of sort of the arts and um, diplomacy, foreign policy, and so forth. Um, to think about the activities of education, performance, um, cultural diplomacy, expertise, um, pedagogy in general together in that way. Um, and so this kind of, um, you know, I did a bunch of dissertation work that looked at um, emergent museums in uh, contemporary urban China, and so I did a lot of work on thinking about the genealogy of, um, of sort of the um, uh, exhibitionary modernity, so to speak. Um, 
And I, the second realm, I think that's really interesting, um, uh, uh, something that kind of I could pull out of my, um, my work would be to think about the intersection of, uh, it might be of interest to some of you, would be to think about environmental justice and, and politics. Um, this certainly is a very active area um, um, uh, in, in, as a sort of huge convergence of um, arts and, and policy uh, around um, the environment, landscape, um, different you know, science, bioethics, right, this whole realm. And um, for me, as a geographer, thinking about the nature-society kind of interface is just the bread and butter of the discipline. But um, my work sort of went in the direction um, here of looking at um, issues of toxicity and militarism. And so I have um, all sorts of work that I've worked on. We're speaking in terms of collaboration. All those things come out of kind of interrogating the, the notion of form. Um, the only other thing I wanted to sort of uh, pop into this is something that, that I was talking about at the table as well, which is that as I've been hearing on the news the last couple of days about, um, about all of the, the new domains that are, that, uh, you know, dot Google and dot Volvo and whatever, that we're going to start seeing entire domains that people are paying 185k a piece just to apply for. And I thought, a dot art is that the idea of what is the, can we, you know, can there be a container big enough where we can do the in, interrogating uh, both virtually and in face-to-face -face, um, that where, where we can learn a language that's more effective so that we don't continually have what happens uh, here, the, the emblem that we all think of in America, of the NEA4, and what happened when we didn't have a language that was as effective a language as the right had. And uh, until we have a language uh, and structures that are as effective as, I don't want to get into an us and them thing here, <laughs> but uh, w there needs to be a way in which we can talk to each other in ways that are not uh, as one of my colleagues was saying at the table today, you know, are not just opaque to everybody else that you get in a room. Mm -hmm. How do we have language where we can talk to each other? And I think a lot of that comes in our processes and in our, the forms that we may work in. Great, thank you, Anita. I'm going to turn in a second to Joseph Meagle because that question of form and process is at the center of kind of what you've been dealing with in Chapel Hill. I'm just curious, though, it feels like there's been some how questions. Erwin said how, and then you just said how. I just want to, like... To, like, we have to take the temperature of the room and see if there are thoughts on the how questions before I turn to Joseph. Yes, please. I have a question. My name is Allie. I am um, in the school of school and service at Georgetown. And um, I just found that although Georgetown has all these amazing opportunities, the problem is with really the mentality of the school and the mentality of being in Washington and being, you know, uh, known for its school of and service. How do you change the mentality so that students who have these artistic interests are um, are able to take these courses and not deter just because it's not you know the what, what the school is known for? I have I have um, friends who are the, sorry, I have friends who are in the school of foreign service and have a great interest in the arts but are simply majoring in international political economy because culture and politics. I mean, I don't mean this in a defensive way because I am a culture and politics major. It's seen as the soft major. It's seen as, you know, I say I'm a culture, I say I'm in the school for a service, and then I say I'm a culture and politics major, and people go, oh, as if that is not, you know, in the same category as foreign service. So how do we change the mentality of Georgetown, of other universities, so that the arts aren't seen as, you know, this Push the side, you can go, you know, you can create all these amazing opportunities sure. and curriculums. Yes. Yeah, how, how do we how do we then actually make that change the student body and mentality? You know? And my sense is it's not, as you said, it's not it's not just a Georgetown problem, it has its particular flavor here, but it's a problem and it's not just a university problem. <laughs> it's a problem <laughs> but, it, but it manifests in a specific way because Georgetown of Georgetown is specific. And I'm saying we've been talking about it on such a global scale that, you know, if we zero in, the, the problem is or how we make changes the university level. You know, I'm 20 years old, how, uh, my friends are, you know, young. If, if we're not given the opportunities to 
um, experience the arts, and if we're not pushed and motivated to take these arts classes, then you know we're just going to generate the future generation, which has a lack of appreciation for the arts. And I think that, for example, it's not required in our core at Georgetown, right. whereas other disciplines are. We, you can take it to fulfill the humanities reading and writing requirement. You can take an art course, but it's not required. So we're servicing a lot of hows, which is good. I mean, like the hows are good. Like and you know thoughts on the I mean you know ideas, responses. Jonathan, I was just going to react to that point because studies have been done that show that in the State Department itself, the cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy area is the lowest of the low, mm -hmm. and that, that it's very rare for somebody who comes through the, the public diplomacy home to rise up to the level of ambassador. It almost never happens. Mm -hmm. Cynthia is a great exception. Uh, but you didn't rise up, you were a political appointee. <laughs> you were cherry picked. But, um, you know, so I think it's a societal issue and reflected here, and unfortunately. And at the institutions that many of us teach at, the pra practitioner is somewhere below the scholar. I mean, if, if you know, yeah. the, the stratification continues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stephen Stern. Um, for the very same James Wilkinson, um, who was referred to by Alicia from the Kennedy Center and all of these festivals, I was part of a core team in the late 90s that helped him develop a culture and sustainable development initiative at the World Bank, which flourished and faltered. And um, one of the great connections that we made is that there were uh, crusty engineers going out in, into the world who, when we started pushing culture and putting them in touch with culture, realized all along they were doing culture without knowing it. And there were powers and capacities to be tapped. Now, there are advantages to being a cultural sector and building up that sector in such a role, but that, that doesn't really do it. The whole notion of development is how different cultures do their own self-development, how you come in and, as an intervener from all of this, and when the economists take it over, sometimes for, for good. I mean, one of the greatest things that the economists at the World Bank did is show everyone that investing in women's education is the best investment you can make, but this cultural, it's po it really is possible. I saw it time and time again with, you know, when I was there and suddenly I was in this culture of sustainable development. I said, oh, your background makes sense. Uh, and to show the sense out in the field and the world with, um, with people and cultures trying to develop them themselves, it's a, it's a long, long fall that uh, there are possibilities. Mm -hmm. And just as a quick observation, it feels like some of our challenges are internal to the arts and cultural because we also structure ourselves in terms of, our, I mean, I think a lot of the organizations I'm part of, like, you go to the TCG conference, as great as it is, and like the managing directors meet with the managing directors, and these people, you know, and so like, in fact, we're in our own kind of enclaves, it seems, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, that, you know, that position or stratify or ghettoize or whatever ourselves, even within our kind of core skill sets to reach across. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, and it's a big societal question that's not, that we're not, we're not victorious over and others are the problem. Well, but that's what I think is so exciting to see now in America, I feel, where theater companies and theater buildings, so to speak, are starting to work, to collaborate with universities. Because for a long time, there was also the academia was kind of lower, or it wasn't as interesting uh, as, the, as the actual field out, out there. Mm -hmm. And now the two are starting to move to each other, and mm -hmm. I think that's a very good movement. Great. I'm gonna, that's a great, I want to, can you, Joseph, <coughs> give an example as artists in residence at UNC Chapel Hill and building the process series, working some internationally with graduate students there, a professional kind of identity within the campus there. Do you want to speak to that a bit? Sure. I, I, you know, I, I, I think a lot about how hard it is to do cross-disciplinary work, even though it's so encouraged to talk about mm -hmm. the university because of the borders that we create in disciplines and, and people getting stuck. And um, I, my background being new play development, I ran um, a theater in New Jersey, the Playwrights Theater in New Jersey, which was exclusively on developing new theater. I wanted to take some of that work into the university and I, I, I do it both in the classroom and then in a program that, I, that I've created with Carolina Performing Arts and Emil Kang, the presenting, uh, you know, the presenting arm of UNC. And that would be called the, Pro the Process Series, which is new works in development. 
and um, it gives room and, and space for artists to develop new work over time in, in the performing arts, not just theater, but in music and dance, cross-disciplinary work, uh, hybrid work, uh, mediated work. All of these types of different pieces come into the process series. We give them time to develop them at the university in space. Um, and, and what I've discovered, um, I mean, a very exciting discovery is that the university then becomes a really interesting and active incubator because we've got actually experts. We've got scholars available to those artists who don't necessarily have access or direct access. So if someone's doing something on physics, there's a, you know, we, we can take them to that department or an environmentalist or an urban planner. So that, that artists have begun to discover that, uh, you know, unlike the O'Neill or, or other professional developmental environments that, that give you some space and time to work on, on, on your work, um, the university actually has resources that go beyond the library. But, and, and there seems to be some energy back from the scholars. There seems to be, you know, to be asked and to be engaged with different pieces artistically become, becomes in, innovating, uh, innovating and, and, and exciting to, the, to those scholars. And I, I'm, I'm sort of surprised at sort of the willingness because, you know, everyone's trying to avoid being on another committee at the university. But, um, but it, it, you know, the opportunity to work with City Company, you know, on, on a piece or the opportunity to work with... Uh, Mark Goodmoody, uh, Joseph on his environmental piece that he's taking across the country um, uh, becomes something uh, exciting and, and, a, and a place for um, in interactions to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, the purpose of the process series is to demonstrate to students and the community and the, and, and the campus to demonstrate what artists do to develop new work and to, to create a laboratory that has a, you know, uh, that has a visibility, that has a transparency in terms of watching artists create. So we're, you know, we're going to bring um, we're going to bring some puppeteers like Tori Bend or, or, or um, um, uh, our artists with a twist, uh, Basil Twist, uh, to to the community and and watch their new works happen, both in rehearsal and development. And then there'll be some sort of presentation of the work wherever it is. And, and we engage with a critical analysis of that work. Uh, uh, and the other thing, you know, you do learn as you work up with more and more disciplines, like composers don't want to think that they're not done when they're done. You know, they, they've written all the notes on the, what, what could, more could they do, right? Whereas playwrights are seem willing to listen and hear and watch. And so you, you also feel elasticity and, uh, about what development is and what that form of that thing is. Uh, that, that you're creating, and, and how does that particular artist get there. So it, it, it seems to me that the university is a, is a great place to, for that work to happen. And in the, pro, in, the, in the series, we always pick one student work um, that raise, has risen to the top. Um, the first year was this student who went to Tanzania and did all of this ethnographic work and about the, you know, the politics of development. and. AIDS and performance, and how performance is used for education, and in different ways in Tanzania, and and she put all of this in one performance, and I worked with her in in my practicum to develop it. But it was such a remarkable piece at the end where she played all of these different beautiful people that she met there um, in this ethnographic performance that uh, we sort of put it in the process series, and she's been able to travel it around to many many different conferences around. Uh, around the country, and indeed was invited back to Tanzania to perform it, and, and I went with her. So, so those are the types of things, and those are the types of interactions that can happen, and I think uniquely at the university. Okay. Yes. I, I think, um, I, I'm just, to pull up language again, even the word development <coughs> is interesting to me that we use a word across these disciplines and mean different things by it, but there are ways that we might mean similar things by it. And looking for portals, you know, of understanding and development is always, we have development officers who do one thing for an arts organization, we talk about students, some of the students say, I'm working in development, I don't know what they're talking about. Are they, are they developing a new play? Are they doing stuff in school for arts service? Are they writing a grant? That's interesting to me in terms of the fact that it, they might be doing all three, you know, and what, what's the connection there. 
I want to turn, we're really, we're privileged to have one of the most distinguished members of this community, Professor John Bull of Islamic History and Associate Director of the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. There's so many things I think you can bring from your perspective. I'm, you know, there's a lot of, I'm curious about these hows, this kind of, <laughs> the hows that are sort of like saying, how do we do this, how do we do this? And you, I think, are, have insight potentially into uh, the perspective of people who, you know, who might be, uh, have some, some responses to those halves or ideas about those halves. So I'm curious. Okay. Yeah, there are, there are a couple of things, just to be kind of quick. Uh, there are probably two things that I just want to explore in terms of the how. The discussions have been talking about how do we do X, how do we get, uh, performance, how do we cross disciplines and so on, for basically young adults and adults. When we talk about curriculum, we're talk, uh, we've been talking about college level and maybe graduate student programs. Uh, it seems to me that to, end, to deal with your sort of issue, if we have not been successful in introducing an appreciation of the artistic dimensions of human culture before people are freshmen in college, we've lost the battle. And I really think that if we're talking you know, our, uh, uh, the, the actual next generation curricular approaches, if we're thinking about curricular approaches to create the broader world that we're seeing as desirable, you start when well, you start by playing Mozart or uh, e exotic music of some sort, or my favorite Arabic music, uh, next to the womb uh, before you're born. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, 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 there are these studies that say uh, womb, uh, fetuses that have listened to Mozart, uh, you know, for nine months uh, have different thought processes than fetuses that didn't. And so I think that part of, the, part of the challenge is that we are all very um, involved in the intellectually challenging kinds of issues that deal with our age grade. Now, my age grade is a lot different than most of the other, I, mean, I think there's only one other person in, <laughs> that's in my age grade here. Uh, but, you know, what we've got uh, what we've got is a challenge of saying how do we get from womb to grave appreciation of the kind of issues that we're talking about. And I think that the real, the, the, starting, the starting place where, we, where the arts have lost uh, is in the elementary school. And is, you know, if uh, I, truth in advertising, I mean, I'm, uh, I was a Suzuki parent, uh, and my daughter and I lived with the violin from the time she was two and a half. Now, her violin was about like that, and, you know, I couldn't even hold it in my hand. But, you know, that, uh, uh, watching the thousands of, I mean, when we went to Suzuki camp, when she was in uh, fifth grade and sixth grade, you know, these thousands of, of people from, you know, three feet high to six feet high, all playing twinkle, twinkle, twinkle. Uh, but, you know, they came out of it with a kind of artistic literacy that simply was totally different from the kind of literacy, the kind of sensitivity that you have if you have a formal music course, a uh, music appreciation course when you're in high school. And so that our curriculum, our, uh, our curricular issues mean that we have to invent and develop stronger ways of having appreciation for and involvement in all of the arts from elementary school through what I like to think, I mean, I'm more interested in religious instruction, I mean, I, I work more in religious instruction than in uh, artistic instruction, but I think of my activities with people in the State Department uh, and with other sort of various and sundry people, uh, I think of it as adult continuing education. You know, and that this is, this, we've got to, we can't stop. We've got to continue to educate both ourselves and everybody else. But the curricular issues are not just sort of college, they're, they're everything. Uh, the second thing then, 
is in terms of then the, again the sort of the more kind of specific how to and Shiloh was talking about what she does in classroom. Increasingly, we all have the advantage of being embedded in immense amounts of information. But increasingly, because of the kind of media through which we have access to the information, increasingly, um, information is performance. That, again, truth in advertising, I am a pure constructionist. No human being, no human being, in my view, knows the, abso knows the absolute truth. The only truth that any human being knows is what their senses provide their particular internal computer with. And so that all of our knowledge is construction. And construction is performance. And so I think that one of the things that I have found as, uh, as we have increasing access to uh, information is performance, is that we have to change how, I'm a historian, we have to change how we train people to do analysis. When I grew up, I, uh, I'm old enough that I grew up in a time when uh, Orientalism was a respectable, was a respectable academic discipline, uh, and language was important, and textual criticism was important, and so on. I think now texts are important, but texts are now performance, and so we have to shift from the old-fashioned, we're all into the textual analysis mode and shift into even our documents as being performance modes rather than textual modes. And just, just as closing then, we have lots of different performance modes. And one of, one of the lovely things now uh, in our seminar room and in lots of our rooms, uh, you can clunk into YouTube and things like that. And YouTube is an unending joy for finding really strange things. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, when we were in my class on Islamic movements, uh, in my class on Islamic movements, one of the movements that we talk about is Hezbollah, uh, the, quote, uh, radical is Islamist Shiite movement in Lebanon. Well, I found on YouTube a marvelous 10-minute segment which took a major speech by Nasrallah, who's the head of Hezbollah, and took out of this sort of hour-long speech all of the jokes that he told. <laughs> and so you have this sequence of about 10 minutes of, his, uh, of Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, telling jokes. And by then, he's a really great stand-up comic. <laughs> and so what we did in class then was we talked about his stand-up comic grade as a performance for expression of political views. Now, you know, before YouTube, that's really not possible. Uh, but, it, but we now have this kind of access, and it emphasizes, you know, we could, have gone, we could have gone through the text. We could have gone through the text of Nasrallah's speech and done a textual analysis, and Professor Sir Hamilton Gibb would have been proud of the textual analysis that we could have done. Uh, but instead, what we had was this, this grand performance mode of the stand-up comic. And in this, it was a shared learning experience because the graduate students in the class pay a lot more attention to stand-up comics than I do. Uh, but, you know, we could talk about then stand-up comic rate as a mode of political critique and political criticism or sit-down comic rate like John Stewart uh, and so on and, and wor work on it this way. And I think then performance, if we expand our sense of performance to the idea of performance as knowledge, uh, that we can also find ways then, vehicles for incorporating into anthropology, uh, into sociology, or into lit crit, or whatever, we can find ways of incorporating performance arts into our social science and humanities analysis. Mm. It's great. I mean, I think it makes me think so much of the, the work of Shahid Nadim that we've had in the in here, and you've given us a really interesting how. I'm not the, the hard how as a parent. I'm like, how do we solve the problem of our kids not getting arts in the computer? That's, that's that one. I don't know we, that we have an answer to. But this idea of laughter, which those of us is a very deep. It's not. You know, we understand that like actually Stephen Colbert in certain ways is 
is creating aspects of a revolution. And when we work on the Greeks, we understand how close laughter is physically to empathy and opening and to tears and to sort of spaces where things get exchanged. And it strikes me as, as one how that if in these moments, these forums, these places where the ice needs to be broken and deeper understandings are created, if part of the strategy is to like get some laughter going between people around something that is about deeper stuff, as Shahid's work is so emblematic of, that's, that's, that's a hope.